welcome to the PC Perspective Podcast. It is podcast number 750. Not a 750, just podcast 750. We are recording this on November 29th, 2023. And I'm your host, Josh Walbrith. I'm Jeremy Hellstrom. I'm Brett Van Spruenberg, and welcome to the All Amiga Q&A uh, show. I'm not sure if that's what you meant uh, to tune into, but that's what's going to happen. No. Yes. That's, yeah. That's, so we're just going to talk the Amiga, Amiga 1000. Of course, a retroactive name for the original Amiga, mm-hmm. which uh, launched in 1985. I'm Sebastian Peake. Welcome to Amiga that's, Chat. That's so nice. <clears throat> At least, uh, you know what, you're not talking about the Commodore 64. We can, though. Maybe that's that's going to be another retro show. We can do that, Maybe. Too. Maybe, yep. or the ColecoVision. That's even No, better. I didn't have one, but a, a friend of mine did. Yeah. It was great, great graphics for the time. Just not very successful, and the controllers were crap. They kept breaking. Anyway, you know, you can support this site and the podcast distribution by heading over to patreon.com slash pcper and become a patron. A patron of... The farts, because somehow this f- is art. <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of this week in Patreon, Brett, Brent, Bront, take it away. Yeah, um, definitely uh, coming to you from an undisclosed location where I am still definitely under uh, significant witness protection. I'd like to uh, send out a great big thanks to Chris, if that's your real name. Chris. Really appreciate your patronage here, throwing a couple of uh, bucks into the kitty, because that just keeps this whole thing spinning around and keeps me safe wherever I'm located in the world. So, I appreciate it. Thank you. Wow. Thanks, yeah, Chris. Mm-hmm. And now um, it's, security it's very... does not come cheap. Just telling no, you that right now. No, it does not. Uh, this is kind of odd and strange and awkward, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, talking about the food with me. So on to yeah. food with me. Josh, what did you have to eat today? Well, it's funny you asked that. <laughs> I uh, actually had the same thing I had two weeks ago, I believe. The fatty patty. It's essentially a patty melt that uh, it's on rye bread. It's cheddar and Swiss. It's caramelized onions. There's some kind of sauce in there. I can't remember. And then the uh, the, the smash patty. I mean, it's... It was so good that even though I had my I had my choices today, this was still the special. And don't mind that you know that rye bread looks like it's you know absolutely charred. It was not charred at all. It's just rye bread in bad lighting and toasted. But it was it was perfect. And the rye that they're using is is fantastic. I mean, it's still got the fennel seeds in there. It's it was great. So yeah, it's it's cheesy, it's melty, it's it's got rye bread. The fries were great. I you know, it was it was it was a very very pleasant pleasant afternoon after having that lunch. So, there you have it. The fatty patty. Adele is spending 25 billion to have TSMC fab their CPUs. Jeremy, I'm I'm assuming this is you. Uh, I don't think it was Bront. Bront I put it in here, but yeah. You know, whatever. No, so uh, uh, next about. year, the three <laughs> nanometer uh, tiles, they're going for about a $4 billion order, uh, which is, you know, impressive and is a hell of a way to get around some of the uh, sanctions that are going to be in place and possibly hurt them. And that's just tipping, putting their toe in the water because 2025, they're looking more like $10 billion worth. And so Lunar Lake, which is the sort of the next refresh that we're waiting for, or second refresh, will be the first one that's completely fabbed externally. Because Intel up until now has been very much an internal shop, but things are not going well for them on a couple of the uh, factories they were hoping to start out with. So this ensures that, hey, they've got a good supply of three nanometer wafers or... uh, three two plus 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 perhaps uh, we, we shall see hmm. it's it's not new i mean your uh arc was fab there uh and uh meteor lake was sort of using them but not completely whereas lunar lake is going to be completely tsmc battle mage and celestial well 
if they're spending 14 billion in the next two years and more after that to bring up to the, the entire uh, total, you can pretty much guarantee that's where they're going to be coming from as well. So it's uh, a big change for Intel. That's always been so inclusive or, or insular rather. Yeah. It's so going to uh, help. Uh, go ahead. Brett. It's going to help uh, alleviate the chip shortages that everyone has experienced in trying to purchase arc in the past. So arc is going to be far more readily available as well as all their CPUs. So if you've had trouble buying an Intel CPU, this is really going to help because this extra production capacity is really going to, going to take a bite out of those shortages. Right. Um, that I shortages have, have they no. had uh, is this, is forget this everything. Issue? Okay. Forget everything I just said. That was a bit uh, <laughs> tongue in cheek. They haven't <laughs> had any shortages with no, 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 no. This is all, all tongue in cheek. They're, uh, you know, this is a big departure for them. I got to agree with Jeremy. Sorry, Jer- uh, Josh. Correct. Uh, what is it? Uh, five, four nodes in five years is what they're, they've been promising. I can't remember the exact number because to me, it's, it's, it's honestly a lot of marketing speak. I mean, don't get me wrong. Intel fab engineers are, are among the best mm-hmm. in the world, but strange things happen. And uh, if you go down a road that may not be as, um, well, it may be a little too aggressive for what physics actually allows for, uh, you can have problems. And so they've been they've been chasing TSMC for the last couple of years. Um, so it makes sense that if they truly want to be cutting edge, uh, TSMC has, has the clean, clean room space to handle more Intel um, orders. And they're happy, happy to take them while Intel hopefully gets their manufacturing uh, under control. Because up until a couple years back, I mean, Intel had more clean room space than anybody else on the planet. And I'm not entirely sure if that is true anymore, or especially stuff that is in uh, at least, you know, cutting edge. Um, process tech. So I'm not shocked. <clears throat> um, it's it's interesting, you know, I mean, looking back at, at the original arc, it was a six nanometer, which was an optimized seven nanometer TSMC product. Um, runs well. They've shipped as many as they've really wanted, uh, which sadly is only like one to 2% of, of the marketplace, which is unfortunate because hardware wise, it's a great part and they have really, you know, put the time in with the drivers and software. So it's it's competitive and it's cheaper than pretty much anything else at those price points. Price and performance points. But yeah, I mean, you either adjust to the market or you just keep losing market share. And I'll tell you, mobile is, is still a big part of uh, Intel. And, uh, you know, going with, you know, I... A process like TSMC's three nanometer, uh, it makes sense when when they're a couple of generations back and they're still trying to push that ragged edge. And, and TSMC is actually, you know, shipping stuff on three nanometer. So, mm-hmm. yeah, a uh, legitimate question regarding TSMC and the season. Oh. Um, do you think that this? Correct me if I'm wrong, but around this time last year, there was a significant water shortage. Was it, are we moving into that? that uh, dry season in uh, Taiwan right now. And could we see some unfortunate chip uh, production difficulties due to walk in this year? You remember that last year? Well, I, I do remember that. And let me answer that with, I don't know. Hmm. <laughs> but with this so much why, of the production. This is why you tune into PCPro.com for that kind of exactly. people, yeah, people don't know answer. anything. We just simply ask a lot of questions that nobody knows the answers to. It's but. like what the French call a certain... I don't je know what. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's a little je ne sais quoi. Yeah. <laughs> That's what Josh was saying. Uh, c'est la vie, c'est la guerre, c'est la pomme de terre. Yes, uh, indeed. Discord chat since it's, says it's been very moist. Until uh-huh. yep. <laughs> Next week looks pretty dry, but apparently it's been relatively moist. Until Isn't this whole Intel TSMC thing less about the weather and more about the fact that they've come to terms with uh, they can't get down to three nanometer on their own. Yeah, so it's like, that's but, yeah, uh, that guy, what, that guy, TSMC. what that guy said. Yeah. Because <laughs> we're making all these promises and we keep on falling short and it's bad for our reputation. And, and Samsung's already playing with two and uh, Glofo is about there too. That's yeah. Sad. Samsung's going to be kind of aggressive in the next yep. couple of years with uh, 
their lineup. So uh, it'll be curious who uh, who heads over that way. And Global Foundries is still floundering. Found, foundering? Anyway. Yes. So, uh, yeah, Tiny 11, talk to us. Well, it's, it's not... Tiny 11 itself isn't new. What it is is a shrunk-down version of Windows 11 that mostly worked but had some issues, but it got rid of Edge, so you didn't have to worry about Copilot. You didn't have to worry about anything. You can install it on like one of those Surface devices with 64 gigs of local storage because a normal Windows 11 install is pretty much going to blow it out completely. But what they did do was release uh, the 23H2 update, which amazingly enough made it about 20 megs smaller. Uh, so it's, they're sort of suggesting you go with a, a fresh install as opposed to an upgrade, but on this version, you will be able to upgrade because they did fix windows update. That had been a problem previously where you had to actually go out and hunt down the knowledge bases, uh, separately or hope that someone would provide a package for you, but they've, they've stuck with the same sort of thing where it's the absolute minimum you need to run windows 11, as far as drivers and desktop go, uh, anything else. You have to pop on yourself if you want, but it's not a free Windows replacement. Like you still need to have a Windows license to be able to install it properly because it is still Windows 11. It's not supported by Microsoft. It's its own little thing. But when you've got little tiny device or devices with a little tiny amount of local storage that you actually want to be able to play with, this is a fun way to do it, especially if it already has a Windows license and you can go up to Windows 11 and actually have a couple of uh, gigs of storage left. I hmm. assume this is game tested and uh, play approved. Well, I mean, your mileage may vary. And, uh, you know, I, I hate to move on to this next topic because it's a little dry and it's a little boring because you, know, <sighs> you talked about it last week, Josh. Hey, uh, eagle eyed viewers who were, you know, uh, subscribed to our YouTube channel and were alerted when we went live last week randomly on a Wednesday mm -hmm. before Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. Josh talked mm -hmm. about NVIDIA financials then. He's going to talk about them now so just go back and edit in i'm kidding <laughs> i didn't record it <laughs> still on youtube that's true it is anyway Forever. yeah uh yeah we don't want to do that uh you know nvidia announced their uh latest quarter results and they were obnoxious um what was it 18 to 19 billion in gross revenue 18.1 uh, billion. Eight, yeah, 18.1 billion dollars in revenue. And uh, net was about 9 billion, uh, which is insane because AMD only made, what, 8 something billion at, at their peak. Uh, so NVIDIA is just printing off money with AI because here's the deal. They've got really good hardware for AI. They've got really good drivers and they've got framework and software stack that is unmatched across the entire industry. Intel, AMD, they're all trying to catch up. But this is something that, uh, you know, NVIDIA has been working on uh, for, uh, you know, essentially 20 years since GPGPU was even a thought in their head. It's like, hey, you know, we just introduced our first. Um, FP32 based um, programmable shading core it could do a lot more things than just you know play games and even though the GeForce FX was not great by any stretch of the imagination uh, they, they kind of saw that they could do a lot more things with this that CPUs cannot and that has only just expanded over the years and uh, we were introduced with CUDA some 12, 15 years ago. I can't remember exactly when. Um, but yeah, they've they've made a mint. Uh, they, they sold half a million chips in this past quarter. Uh, and when you're selling those at some 10 to 50,000 a piece, you can see where the profits come from. And their margins are something like 75 percent now obviously this is big data center uh what they're, they're selling all these parts to dg1 the latest versions of all that uh grace hopper is coming out grace grace is coming out it's all 
just big money to them because nobody has anything that competes very well because not only is the hardware good, other people's hardware is good, but software stack, drivers, framework, all that stuff, they've got the market cornered. They seeded these universities from 12, 15 years ago uh, with CUDA and supported them with hardware and software and the people who, you know, have gone through these classes and wanted to get a job in the industry and we're doing this, they rely on the tools that they know. So yeah, NVIDIA is, is doing amazing, amazing work. Their, their uh, gaming graphics was only like about 2.9 billion. I mean, it's still a lot of money, but it was not, it, you know, it's down from their absolute highest uh, when, you know, in the middle of the COVID years and the 3000 series. So it's not, uh, you know, it's not a growth part for them. Uh, it's doing well. It keeps them afloat. But yeah, data center. And probably the networking stuff is starting to just ramp up as well. Uh, 250% year on year growth, apparently. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they had an interesting looking networking card that uh, really yeah. uh, partnered well with some of their um, computer compute density things that just came out. To I had a link to it, Jeremy. You had linked to it as I'm well. So the home it it. Yeah, it's um, it's big money for them, and they're happy, and everybody else is sad. Anyway, uh, you know, I, I I really expect these sales uh, for Nvidia to keep going uh, through probably the end of 2024. Then I would expect things to kind of soften up one because competition, uh, the MI 300 from AMD is, is looking good and tells Gaudi and uh, Ponavicchio, uh those things they're, they're making an impact, but I think also that's going to be where we'll see the Amazons and the Microsofts and whatever, start to see a decrease in how much they're going to be utilized and how much they can charge for these compute resources. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, but yeah, NVIDIA has got a year of making hay and Mm -hmm. they can, they can store a battle chest of funds from that at $9 billion a quarter to the tune of they can, they can, they're, they're now making more quarterly profits and revenue than Intel, which 20 years ago, you would not thought that that would be a thing, but it is. So it's insane. But on to better news, (laughs) USB-C powered delivery sniffer. I don't know if this smells good. It sounds bad as well. Better? You have to wait until it gives you the output and then you can tell whether it smells or not. (laughs) <laughs> Is this like so, uh, rama? Yes. So Google did. Tell us about the, fr- uh, the fresh twinkle. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the Google twinkle. But the problem mm-hmm. was they went full out sort of laptop cap- or uh, components on it. So it was kind of stupidly expensive and very, very proprietary. So there's been a couple of projects. This is one of the newer and more successful ones on how to build your own power sniffer so you can actually tell whether or not that USB-C cord is dodgy before it sets your phone on fire, which is, you know, nice to know. And, you know, interestingly enough, like they're, they're talking, well, I mean, all you're doing is reading signal over pins. So literally you could also be checking uh, data and seeing, you know, will this actually do USB-C 3.2 by two, or is this just, you know, not up to snuff? So it's Wait, relatively cheap and easy USB-C- to build. All USB-C yeah. cables aren't the same? What? Strangely enough, we've been told this, and oh. I still remember that You've guy. you X-rays. Worked, yep. Oh, the guy who worked for Google and uh, got his brand new, uh, it wasn't a Chrome, it was a Pixel book of some sort, one of the stupidly expensive ones. Plugged it in and immediately pretty much it fried itself. Ooh. Yeah. So it's kind of important to know just what the power delivery specs on a random USB-C cable you might've picked up are, or I mean, for that matter, did the one that came with your phone come with uh, some really nasty damage to it because it got folded up pretty badly. Hmm. So, you know, it's nice to know if you want to know about it and it'll do live as long as you've got translation going. 
How much are these things? Oh, you build it. Oh, that's right. It's a hackaday project. This is very, very yeah. new. I think <laughs> uh, honestly, the the case will probably be the most expensive part is buying the <laughs> the filament to print it out and making that. Mm. It's a cool project. And some people were screaming and yelling because there's a mini USB plug evident on it, which looks to be a ground. <laughs> so, well, you're, intro you're you're introducing all sorts of different things with that, and it could be changing your like. No, it's just a freaking ground in case. Wait, hmm. it's like the Linux community, and everyone has an opinion that's more important than everybody else's. Strangely enough, weird. You know, speaking of crazy, I, I hear there is an issue with Google Drive and deleting files by magic. Well, it's it's more like time travel than deletion. <laughs> Uh, in that a lot of people's Google Drive folders have gone mm -hmm. back to exactly what it looked like about six months ago or so. And uh, Google swears that it's not deleted. They just have to they've misplaced them momentarily. And don't worry, we will find them. Uh, but one of their biggest things that they immediately said was, well, don't go messing around in your root folders because that'll just destroy the backup process, which, you know, fair point, but lead with the apology and the cause first and then start telling us what to do as opposed to the other way because jeremy, uh doing yeah jeremy just this just feels like when you're trying to do a drive recovery don't write back to the disk it seems like a huge seems silly network though. system like <laughs> google would not suffer from the old like mfm ide don't write yeah. back to the drive because you haven't done the recovery but, yet you'll overwrite your 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 old files yeah, your, that one, but that's one literally what they're saying that's pretty much what it sounds like to me. Yeah, it's bizarre. Yeah, which is terrifying, Who, uh, what is supposed to be such a resilient uh, cloud storage provider. You wouldn't And think. doing a little bit of prying around. Yes, business drives were affected by this as well. Not all of them, but some were. And that goes way beyond your personal files and pictures being gone for a little bit and coming back. We were talking about end of quarter and end of year and suddenly them those entire projects you were working on are gone so i mean there have been worse things one of the other cloud providers essentially they swore that they delete if you delete your data it's gone from their servers and suddenly like stuff that had been deleted three six months ago just suddenly started appearing on people's uh, dropbox that's what it was so that all of a sudden supposedly permanently deleted files were suddenly reappearing in people's Dropbox folders, which in a way is more terrifying than stuff you want to have disappearing stuff. You don't want to have coming back. It was allegedly Sometimes. a fix. Yes, this is not approved, but okay. from the sounds of it, it does work. But considering Google is sort of saying, don't mess with your folders because you're going to ruin or restore, you know, could be, harmful, but uh, maybe not. So speaking of Google, I hear YouTube and Google might actually be sliding mm -hmm. Firefox users, which of course I'm a Firefox user because that's what I have to use with vMix because everything else sucks. It's true. <laughs> with audio <laughs> True. Yeah. So talk to us. Why would YouTube and Google be doing such a thing? Uh, well, it's uh, ad blockers. I mean, that's, that's not the official statement, but it's essentially if you're using a non-Chrome browser, uh, up to and including Edge, apparently, which is an interesting trick, uh, and you have an ad blocker, not even necessarily running, but installed, <clears throat> then you are seeing fairly large delays before a YouTube video will start up. You know, several seconds to 10 or to 15 seconds before the first unskippable ad starts to load. And so a couple of people have been <laughs> using uh, user agent switchers. So I'm running Firefox, but now I'm impersonating Chrome. And strangely enough, that lag just sort of disappears, completely gone. And there have been some people screaming and yelling that they don't even have an ad blocker installed, but are on Firefox and so they're still getting this five second delay on that first unskippable ad. So yeah, it's just, annoying that Google is literally going and onto your machine and judging the performance you get from them based on what you have installed on your own personal machine, which just seems a little bit intrusive for, I wanted to watch a quick US or a quick video on YouTube. 
you know, and ad blockers love them or hate them. And uh, Hey, we kind of like them because it helps bring in a bit of revenue, but can understand if you going to screw us out of that. Uh, but why is Google looking to see if you've got one or not, if you've got it actively running and they can on their end, say, see that stuff's actively blocked. That's one thing going onto your machine to say, does you even have one? Yeah. I don't like that. Yeah, how deep is how deep is their dig when it takes several exactly. seconds to do? Mm. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. It's crap. The other thing is is that there is a is there a power play lawsuit going on in the background here too, Jeremy? That like this could be like a like oh yeah, you're going to sue us or you're going to sue like a uh, related company? Well, we're just going to disadvantage your browser on one of our platforms for a little while. See so, yeah, how you like it? Yeah, I mean, I just made that like- up. <laughs> Well, I don't know. Is there a bunch of antitrust lawsuits or antitrust lawsuits against Google? Some of which have gone poorly for them very recently. Oh yeah, there has been, maybe. hasn't there? Huh. Huh. Hmm. It probably has nothing to do with it. It's just mere no. circumstantial no. Uh, yes. coincidental. Well, it uh, <clears throat> certainly seems like it's that time again, the time where everybody has to go take a couple of acid pills. Yes. And a shot. It's in security corner. <clears throat> Don't break out the ibuprofen. That will only make the stomach worse. <laughs> Jeremy, 20 years of patch Tuesday. I can't decide if it feels more like 10 or 40. <laughs> I wouldn't have pegged it to 2003, but that is when they first realized that, hey, Randomly sniping enterprise machines with updates on an unpredictable schedule was not very appreciated. So they decided to make it so that they just destroyed your machines on the first Tuesday of every month. Second much, Tuesday. much simpler, easier to predict. But I mean, it was more or less appreciated because we would get big emails about what was coming out, what knowledge base things, articles we could go to see what actually was going to be happening. Uh, you know, using various things like WSS or others to delay it for a couple of days. So you can watch a few machines explode, realize what the patch did it, wait for Microsoft to roll it back, fix it. And then you could push stuff out. So it did make things Ah, significantly easier for us. Life is good. Yeah. (laughs) You still get those zero days every once in a while out of the blue, but the thing that it's, it's, you know, it's a Cory Dr. Rowism of the unshittification of the internet, but Remember back in the day when you got those emails with all the KB numbers in it and you would know exactly what would happen as opposed to the mysterious loot box we get on Tuesdays now? No, I I didn't. Security loot box. What? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, It is because you open it up and you'll see what you get. Patch loot box. Nice. (laughs) And speaking of patches, patch your own cloud. Oh my God! Not his cloud. Pa- Patrick his own cloud. cloud. Patrick own cloud. Is is that a Patrick? Your... Is that a is that a, is that an English actor? <laughs> well, Jeremy, we need you a put the climbing song. Oh no! <laughs> a climbing song. That's your own cloud. He's obviously Irish. Oh, I I hate to say it, Jeremy, but uh, for those who are running own cloud, for God's sakes, you've you're Patch probably now. almost you're almost pwned at the moment. This is the elusive but uh, heralded score of 10.0 on the CVE score uh, meter here. It's a remote uh, execution info uh, for those who are familiar with the PHP uh, language. This is a bad one. Uh, If you're uh, running an own cloud and you're exposing it to the internet, uh, sharp intake of breath at this point. Um, Yeah, you may want to get that, uh, I don't even know, turn it off, uh, patch it at least. And uh, thoroughly examine what the heck is going on in your own cloud, <laughs> uh, because it's a good chance that uh, you've been found and owned. Yeah, uh, Jeremy, I want to add. Let's see. Our says, "Get rid of all PHP info files, all of them. You know, even that one that you love." Ph- PHP, the uh, friendly processing language that's running at probably around forty percent of the internet, uh, is with us to stay. So um, that's just the facts. <laughs> Uh, you know what? A Jeremy and his uh, and his uh, titles. Naughty no, or nice? I, I I did that. I so that's you. No, you I tried to one up him. I tried to one up oh. him with this. 
Kanadi or Kanice. They can know. <laughs> they do can know. So it's apparently once a year, Mozilla gives you a, a, it's not even a top 10 list. It's like a top hundred list of the worst in privacy devices you can buy. And it'll come as no surprise that the ring is still up there because, well, I mean, we know about all the vulnerabilities and Google's just realized that no one cares and just sort of lets it go. Uh, Kindles and fire TV, you know, we've, if you pay attention, always knew that uh, it's, it's listening to you. It, it, it knows all. And it's not that they're selling the data. They're just using it internally to be able to market to you more effectively, but still it's kind of creepy. Uh, Xbox does the same thing. So with, uh, and uh, especially if you sign up to their uh, monthly gaming subscription, but uh, Sonos and Bose uh, are all brand new and Google, which, you know, usually it's just some of their stuff, but never been really nasty this year. They made it pretty high up. And the reason is because when they're harvesting your data of which you really probably should look into exactly how much they're harvesting, they're using it to train their AI models. So it's not even just targeted ad anymore. It's it's targeted AI and you are now an input source for their black box so they can help learn how to communicate better. A little bit creepy. So yeah, you can read through the entire list if you really want to. Uh, probably if you haven't finished your shopping yet, you probably should because, you know, we've just recently had web or recently had lawsuits where uh, Alexa was kind of listening to kids and not deleting stuff afterwards and a variety of other just really disturbing things. So yeah, put, put these guys on the naughty list when you're uh, going out shopping. Yeah, re reason 9000, I don't have an Alexa in my home. <laughs> Actually, my LG TV mm -hmm. has Alexa in installed, but it is it is disabled. Yeah, but yeah. Well, you think it is. Yeah. Yeah, maybe not. LG, screw you guys. Anyway, <laughs> uh, ransomware. Okay, talking about some messed up laws and people that can hire really high profile lawyers <laughs> and do things. Yeah. Uh, a ransomware group actually reports the victim to the sec. <laughs> uh, it seems like fantasy. It seems like uh, you can't even write this headline as a pretend, but no, this is real. Uh, a yeah. financial services company called Meridian link was uh, hacked by a, uh, uh, it's, this is hardly even news anymore. You know, big financial group hacked by active ransomware group uh, taken over, uh, and, uh, after a period of time there, uh, they reported the, the, the ransomware group actually reported the Meridian link to the SEC for not reporting their own hack as, uh, the latest law that I don't think has quite gone into effect, but the spirit of it has been in effect for quite some time where a company that's been hacked is supposed to report to various agencies that, oh, Hey, we've suffered a breach and here's what's at risk. And they didn't say anything within that time period. So the company or the company, the ransomware group that hacked them reported them for not reporting that they hacked them. Well, as long as they have to show up personally in court. <laughs> this is, <laughs> I, this is, doesn't this seem <laughs> like it, it could be a, a chapter in Snow Crash? Yes. Oh, my gosh. Neil Stephenson, Snow Crash. <laughs> or good, Kafka. Good throw. Good throw. Yeah. The, the criminals who, you know, had a slightly unsuccessful hack, uh, you reported them to the to the authorities, and the authorities yeah. cracked down on on the legit company. It's it's. Yeah, don't worry, Josh. They're going to listen to reason. Well, aren't they? <laughs> Which they the corporation will. or the hackers? <laughs> Everyone will listen to reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, well, even more great news. Um, oh, yeah. It's probably going to be bad. It's worse than bed bugs. NVR and home slash hotel routers. Because who doesn't so, Jeremy, want someone to have root access yeah. to your video cameras? 
Oh yeah, this is a non-linear video recording uh, system. Yeah, and a very popular um, router that is both used in the home and hotels. I can't imagine. You know, when they, they say it's popular, so it's probably by a typical. You know, I'm not. I, I really don't know. It could be an uh, like a Netgear thing. You know, a TP Link. Uh, you know, a Linksys type thing. Yeah. We don't know, and that's sort of the danger here. Uh, go ahead, Jeremy. If you want to comment on this one? Well, I mean, they're they're not saying because they've reached out to whoever whomever it is. Suppose I would assume and say you need to patch this and you need to patch this now. Yeah. And if you don't, uh, they, they're saying they're working on a fix that will be deployed sometime this month or sorry right next month. Uh, if they don't, that name's coming out. Yeah. Well, the patch is going to come out. And what it fixes is going to be documented. And the this is a this is a specific NVR manufacturer, uh, but it's again it's a very fairly popular uh, router, probably Wi-Fi combo device that's uh, again popularly uh, used in you know various hotels and and home. I wish we knew what it was, but at the same token, I'm glad they haven't published it yet because it's still yes. they're still vulnerable. But well, when this they does are get vulnerable. published. Yeah. So unfortunately, there's uh, systems and devices out there that are being hacked as we speak. And the various companies are working on getting this patched. Uh, this is probably going to be a horror show in full motion here in a week or so after they get a patch out there um, when everybody needs to scramble to keep this one. So this is more like a uh, let's wait for the party to get uh, really bad. Uh, yeah. This is this is going to be very unfriendly and probably in about a week. We'll, we'll revisit uh, the, the people story that, see where it goes. Yeah, the people <clears throat> that design it are often obviously very nice people and very mature because they've named this mm-hmm. infective, infected slurs because all yeah. the variables, the CNC names are just like ridiculously horrific. So the code makes for interesting reading probably. <clears throat> I bet. I'm never staying in a hotel again. No. And we thought that the Airbnbs with the, uh, uh, what would you call that? Uh, um, Hidden cameras? The naturally placed uh, cameras. Yes. Not naturally. What's, what's, what's another better word for that? Clandestinely? No, 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 no. You know, it's like homemade. It's like something. It's, it's you know, anyway. Bespoke. No. <laughs> not organically well, but there, no. there's that other you know it made it home made it it's it's uh, it's another i wish outsider my art was looking working like it was supposed handcrafted but how many other Jerry ways could you say homemade i don't know anyway it'll come to me after yes. the podcast <laughs> it's a farm no, table camera no it was it was not uh that uh, networking group that we love here. Nope, they're safe. John Doc. <laughs> uh, yeah. Anyway, did you use nothing for iMessage on Android? If so, you could have issues. If so, you might want to change fool. your Apple ID password. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, let's, <laughs> let's see. And that's- iMessage is this encrypted messaging service that gives you the blue bubble, and you know how youth culture is about the blue bubble. But Mm. even if you don't care about all that stuff, you should care about using some third party to sign into your Apple account. This thing lasted a day. It was an absolute catastrophe. Yeah. Just assume that you've been owned at this point. It was that bad. Like uh, Sebastian said, it was taken down in a day. There were so many unencrypted holes and ability for uh, other users other than you you and the intended recipient to retrieve your text, images, V cards, everything that you put into it. Hundreds of thousands of people jumped on the We Want Blue Bubbles 2 bandwagon and nothing, and I think Sunbird was the underlying technology behind this, yeah. uh, basically hosed you we'll in a big a, way uh, with a bottle of lip service to security. Yeah. Yeah, they've got a stellar reputation from the uh, previous apps that they've released. Exactly. Yeah. No, I'll be different this time, I promise. Mm-hmm. The uh, the bottom line here is if you did use this, uh, think 
carefully next time before you share your Apple credentials with anyone else. Uh, but you definitely need to log in and change your credentials and kill all sessions. So go in to your Apple account, uh, disconnect everything. Uh, there's only one way to do that, and it disconnects all of your devices at the same time as well. You just got to do it. Yeah, go in and disconnect everything, it. kill all the sessions, and then re uh, change your password, your credentials, and then re up all your devices. There's been very little comment from either Sunbird or or nothing on. Uh, I hate to call it X because I just want to say Twitter, um, but they've uh, have tried to actually defend themselves and say, you know, there's a reason behind why we use HTTP to do this handshake, and we passed your your well, uh, that's what Twitter token. is for now. Well, it is. It's really crappy uh, but, excuses. You know, we, we we passed your your authenticated token across HTTP connections just because of blah 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 one time use and all that. Oh well, anybody who tapped into that uh, HTTP connection and used your token is now you, and can retrieve everything that you had in your account. <laughs> so thanks. Okay, I, I finally remembered the the word I was looking for. Artisanally placed. Oh, artisanal. Ah, yeah. Really, yeah. Yes. Okay, I guess it means like made yeah. artistically. Is that what the word is? Is there an R in what you Artis- said or no? Artis- yeah, it, it's just Art- like it's artisan. it's homemade. It's it's you know someone placed it with care. It was an individual effort. You know, everybody uh, just you know sit back, relax, take a drink, because we're past in security corner. In fact, oh, we're, we're moving along, goodness. moving along to gaming quick hits, which is a lot more enjoyable for most out there. Except, of course, this news. Because it sucks, Jeremy. Well, it does, but there are at least a person working on it. So this came out because of an, it was an interview on Giant Bomb of, uh, you know, someone who, one of the industry insiders that tends to know and sort of said that, hey, uh, sorry, Jeff Grubb of Giant Bomb, who was over at uh, Embracer and, you know, had heard that literally no one is working on KOTOR, on the KOTOR remake at all. Not, not a soul. Well, apparently the uh, CEO of Embracer heard this, obviously a giant Bound fan, and immediately came out uh, with some statements to other places saying that, no, there are actually people, well, maybe person, maybe two people working on the KOTOR remake because, this saga, it's been tossed between about three different companies. Uh, we've had a trailer, which was then disappeared. We had, then Sony picked it up and was sort of pushing it more for console, but had, uh, you know, some music and stuff, but they own the rights to it. And all of a sudden just yanked out all their social media stuff for KOTOR down and said it was something about a, a license dispute, which, I mean, Disney fair, but you do actually own all of that stuff. I don't know. So, yeah. But it is Disney. So it does smell of Disney, doesn't it? It it kind of does. Well, Kotor, you know, I I've heard about it. I still have never played it. Probably it's kind of worth it, although it'll look really yeah. really blocky. Yeah, <laughs> I've, really I've, blocky. I've seen it on my my kids' machine. They they did get Kotor and they tried to run it, and it was it was it was rough. But if you had a Steam Deck, maybe I mean at least that's so yeah. small and compact, it might not. maybe. But I think it'll be like the first Deus Ex. You play the first level just for, wow, this is neat. And then you never go back again. Right. Walking Dead bundle. Talking about things that are walking and dead. It's a bundle. If you like this sort of game, you can get a lot of them all at once. Is this still on? It says Black Friday. Bront? No, it's good for a couple of days. Hey, But I'd never heard of WrestleQuest before. (laughs) <laughs> There's a pro wrestling RPG. What? I am hey, tempted. That actually sounds plausible because, I mean, if you've ever watched wrestling, it's like a soap opera. There's all sorts of storylines. Figures Jeremy would zero in on the filler content for the Walking Dead, you know, <laughs> cluster. <laughs> no, I thought Walking Dead was the filler. Uh, <laughs> mm. This has got all the Walking Dead seasons, plus at least uh, one of the... You know, extensions that they had. Can't By seasons, do you mean of the TV show, or were there that many? No, it's a game. Games. No, the game seasons. So okay. they had the, the oh, Walking okay. Dead 400 series or 400 days. Uh, they had the season one, season two. I, I think up through the like called the yeah. final season. Good old Telltale, tell, eh, Telltale games. Yes, hmm. it's a Telltale games, and if you like that sort of thing, 
you can get, like I said, a lot of it at once for not a lot of money. Okay, so these are based on the comic, not the TV show. Wait, yes. pe- people actually have time to play games? <laughs> I mean, Surprisingly, some people do. Hmm. Uh, yeah, so this is the, the, the other one was... Have to do anything. The the other the other part was the Walking Dead Saints and Sinners. Uh, they had two two seasons or two episodes of that as well. It's done in game form, so that's also in this bundle for twenty five bucks or less. So anyway, Russell Quest. It's a pro wrestling <laughs> RPG <laughs> where uh, you, know, you have to deal with McMahon's. Of uh, course, mm-hmm. it's not officially WWE um, licensed, so. It's probably oh, like it's only the, the knockoff ones. The John Cena, but with an S. Yeah. Mm. It's not the rock. It's like the stone or the boulder. Yes. Yeah. The boulder. I'm, I'm guessing. Sure. I haven't actually played. Well, that, that Russell Quest. Undertaker's now Grave Digger. I mean. Yeah. Well, yeah. what the? Yeah. That's a monster That's truck. But yeah. Different know, uh, but IP. Different IP <sighs> crossover. No, no, no. Avatar, The Last Airbender. The, the boulder. Yes. Yeah, okay. The boulder would, wouldn't work there. So. All right, no, fine. The one. pebble. Fine. That's the way. That's a smart. That's an early smartwatch. Lock. But oh, guess what? Smartwatch. What? And guess take Mason. What, uh, time it is. <laughs> what time? It's time for reviews. Oh crap! We did have a review, didn't we? I yes, thought you were going to say did. it's time huh? for news. It's time for, <laughs> it's time for reviews. reviews. It's time for where is the you money? Know, the, the, the kid with the spindly fingers who does, you know, reviews of the week with food. That guy, I was trying to. Oh, yeah. Like, what is it called? Review of the week or something? And he always does yeah. fast food. Stuff. Now it's yeah. time for review. If you're anything like me, you're always on the lookout for ever more spacious and fast external storage for your various devices, laptops, desktops. Oh, yeah. And it's very convenient. That everything uses USB-C now. And they're all on the same standard. There's USB 3.1, Gen 2, 3.2, Gen 2, and Gen 2 by 2. USB 4, Thunderbolt that isn't always necessarily compatible with other fast USB 3.2 Gen 2 storage options if they're by 2, which I discovered recently. Because I was trying to test this new product. And the last time I got a Samsung portable SSD, it was the T9 just a short time ago, and it's Gen 2 by 2, which means 20 gigabit per second, which is, I think, the nominal, like the slowest speed of USB 4, which can go up to, I think, like 80. So that's, you know, exciting to look forward to. But for now, we're on mostly USB 3 on laptops and desktops. So I'm thinking brand new 8 terabyte T5 Evo from Samsung. This thing's going to be fast. It's going to be... Yeah, baby. And it's 8 terabytes it's just ridiculous that they're they're shipping drives this small with this much capacity now and it's so fast yep. and then i was reading the specs and it's not a 20 gigabit per second device it's not a 10 gigabit per second device it's a 5 gigabit per second oh. device. oh it's actually a little slower than the original t5 which launched in 2017 so if you go back Ooh. six years, Ooh. and I have a T5 laying around in a drawer somewhere, that thing will do like 500 megabytes per second. This will do 460. Oh. Mm. So I'm thinking, you know, at least it's going to be really inexpensive if that's the case. You know, it's not it's not fast. So it's, so it's priced it's, to the performance level, right? Right. So let's check let's check the uh, the pricing here if I can. Oh wait! Oh, <laughs> oh, that it that is eight terabytes that, though. It's I mean that, that is under ten cents six, a gig, but it's six hundred and fifty dollars. Oh, so yeah, I mean, look at that. That's peak performance in Crystal Disk Mark. The maximum theoretical performance I could get out of this thing was four hundred and sixty-six megabytes peak. per second, which is slightly faster than advertised. Well, look at that random though. Yeah, the randoms are impressive. I will give it that. It's, it's no slouch. It's not bad, yeah. really. And in real world, I mean, you have to you know, take into consideration the fact there's some caching going on. So once you get into a steady state with transfers, it's around 350 to 425 okay. megabytes per second. Moving big files around, that's fine. Nothing to be ashamed of. It's still faster than my gigabit NAS. 
proving yet again that sneaker net is the best. Oh, definitely true. Yeah, but, never I under, mean, underestimate the bandwidth of a, of a car full of tapes hurling down the highway. Yes. <laughs> As the author of this review notes, typically when presented with a storage product that offers tons of capacity but below average performance, we're talking about a budget product. And while 8 terabytes is still enough to command a premium in the NVMe storage world, the T5 Evo's $649.99 list oh. price is enough to make this a very hard sell for 5 gigabit per second performance. Well, they tossed something on there because it says 256-bit hardware encryption, so they did toss an extra chip on there, but still. Yeah, geez. but you can get that from the satellite, a SATA SSD, can't you? Don't those yeah, you can. I also, I, I sense, uh, Sebastian, did you try the hardware encryption in, in flight? I sense that that's not going to make this any faster. It can't make it any, right. sl- no. can it make it any slower? I didn't think of well, that. Maybe. If you go to Amazon right now, a 870, a Samsung 870 QVO drive, eight terabytes, 349. Grab yourself an enclosure. Mm, You're at like 360s, 369. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Okay, it's it's a little bit bigger. It's only about half the width of the two and a half drive. Is it soft touch? Is it soft touch? It's soft touch, which also means in a few years it'll be a melted mass. That's, yes, okay, but it's soft touch at first. It is soft touch at first, so if that matters to you. It is a dust magnet. Mm -hmm. It is almost impossible to uh, keep it free of lint. Don't ever put it in your pocket. You will, it will be, Hmm. it will never look the same again. Well, someone will clean your pocket. Confused. Is that an eight terabyte drive in your pocket or? Well, Samsung sure hit that one out of the park. This is why we get the review samples we do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, never trusting us again. Anyway. No, uh, no, yeah. This is it. Picks this is the last time. <laughs> picks of the week. And my pick is this this Black Friday and Cyber Monday. Storage is, yet again, just so incredibly cheap. You can actually find two uh, terabyte PCA 4.0 drives for under $90. This one is really this is oh yeah. If if you if if you've got an OS drive, you should just get one of these. P44 Pro incredibly fla- fast across the entire spectrum of, of performance compared to other SSDs 130 bucks, 2 terabytes. That's just still blows <clears throat> my mind. And so, but yeah, if you want to get a cheaper one, if you want to get a less expensive, slower, you can find them for under 90 bucks now. I wouldn't trust them, but whoa, you can find them. Well, that'll pair nicely with my pick. Oh, Jeremy, go because I've got uh, Canadian pricing as always a good chunk of a system for a really decent price. So, Memory Express, it's an i7 12700K. Uh, MSI Pro Z690A Wi-Fi, Master Liquid 240L cooler, and 16 gigs of 3200 megahertz RAM for 549, well, 550 Canadian. That is the start of a serious system. You're probably going to want to pick up another 16 gigs of RAM. You're going to want to pick up Josh's SSD. And well, if you don't have a power supply in case of kicking around, yeah, you're going to need that. But that is just a really good way of starting off uh, a system. And when I posted this, apparently it was available. I don't know if it still is because uh, at least where I am, it seems to be out of stock. But they have a couple of other kits, the same sort of thing, uh, processor, memory, cooler, and motherboards for other, depending on what you're looking for uh, at very good prices. But that's, that's about half what it would have cost you uh, to pick it up yourself. So, yeah. If you're looking for some stuff to uh, build a new system with, that gets you a really good start. All right. Who's next? Damn it. That'll that'll be me, damn it. Oh, you guys went with a very respectable, in-line, on-topic, uh, techie pick. I went more to the season that we're in. We're all probably buying Christmas gifts. Why not find a little bit of a techie way to enhance that Christmas gift with my pick? Light up the gift this season with brick lights. You're probably buying Legos for your kids. 
If not, you're buying them for yourself. Why not get a lighting kit for your specific Lego kit? They sell so many lighting kits to put in around, under, within, uh, with some uh, specialized bricks occasionally to allow light to pass into certain areas. It is an incredible enhancement to kits that you're probably already putting together and putting on display. Take a look. This isn't the only vendor. This is one that I picked, um, not at random. I actually have uh, a lighting kit here for a Christmas gift. Um, but uh, definitely out there. I think it would be a fantastic, uh, you know, also in a vaguely techie enhancement to um, fun gifts uh, for uh, whoever in your life is getting a Lego kit this year. So go look and see if you, you can uh, grab one of these. RGB itis is spread to everything. Uh, it has, but I, I, I'm going to have to say that it as it kind of enhances some of these Lego kits. They look really cool when you light them up, especially as a Fair. display. If, if you're into that sort of thing, it, maybe you've got a rotating thing, or you know, I know certain people who are uh, like certain properties, you know, movies or franchises or or just cool displays. You know, I, it come to mind with There's like no you know, Star that Wars or Perseverance stuff Rover. Like that kit is forty two bucks. No, but the lighting kit just be probably the way is. <laughs> okay, the lighting kit. <laughs> yeah, the, the the Lego kits themselves are very spendy, as always. Uh, but this is like the final step to a really cool display. In hmm. case anybody didn't know this. People yeah, okay. actually show off their Lego kits. They do. Sometimes lighting can be used for something more practical than just looking cool. What if lighting... <laughs> could protect you what if lighting <laughs> kept you safe you mean like lasers nefarious <laughs> parties who want to uh take your stuff especially this oh, holiday like the season. uh extreme uv lights at the nft party maybe but maybe i'm thinking in terms of you know uh what is the one thing you can always count on proving that you're home if your TV's My on, my kids complain about shit. Clearly, <laughs> if the TV's on, then somebody's home. No one ever oh. leaves their TV on twenty four hours True. a day. True. No, uh, I'm being sarcastic because I know people who do. Mm. But oh, okay. If you look in the neighbor's window and you see lighting against those translucent uh, curtains or shades, then you know they're home. So to this end, fake TV. <laughs> no burglar deterrent. Really? <laughs> now I I learned about this because I obtained one of these recently for uh, absolutely no cost to myself. It was laying in a closet, and I was like, I would like this as a pick of the week. So here it is. It's called Fake TV. It's a little uh, plastic box with hmm. some LED lights in it, and it's probably horribly overexposed here. But the idea is that. Uh, it's just, it's got a red, a blue, I'm sorry, a red, a green, and a blue in the center and what, four no yellow? white ones. And yeah. it just, is that, uh, is that NTSC resolution on that? I just, uh, let me just check. I don't it know. It's, it's okay. hard to see it. It's, this is the worst possible, uh, <laughs> uh, demonstration of this you can imagine, but, uh, anyway, just trust me on this. It, uh, it just shines some cheap LEDs and they kind of flicker. It looks like a it looks like a CRT in action. And I see oh, it's going bright yeah. again. But it randomly changes brightness. Smart. And it's 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 all you need. If burglars see this shining at the inside of your mini blinds, they're gonna say, Whoa, whoa, not this house. I don't care if there's yeah, no car in the driveway. TV. No yeah. car in the driveway, no footprints in the snow leading up to the house. Clearly, these people are home, though, because I see a light against the window. Uh, they're watching the news. so yeah, they, they, they are. They're probably watching Jeopardy. They got Jeopardy on at that time. Mm -hmm. They're watching the Jeopardy. Now, I've got it recording <laughs> at home, so I can watch it when I get done burglarizing these homes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, watch, yeah. I don't really watch right. Wheel as much anymore. They change the rules too much. Uh, I don't think it's fair. The, the Jeopardy, the host. Jeopardy. The, it's... Mm -hmm. I like Ken Jennings. I mean, I remember when he was winning Jeopardy every week, and now he's hosting winning. it. And I think he pays tribute to Alex. I think he's. I think he's a good. He's good for the show. 
Well, you know what? <clears throat> the pain, the pain has, has overcome us all. And uh, we need to stop before we spread more pain onto you because that's the last thing we want to do because unless you're a certain type of person, pain is, is something to avoid. And uh, avoiding this podcast is not something that you particularly want to do on occasion unless, of course, you know, Kent is here, then you want to avoid it at all costs, but don't tell him I said that. So for us tonight... We wish you a fond farewell.